I am preaching today out of Hebrews chapter 11. Um, when Pastor Anthony started preaching about um, God doing immeasurably more than, or a, yeah, immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine, when he started preaching on that, it was literally that Sunday I started reading through um, Hebrews chapter 11, and this spark was ignited in my system and uh, and in my spirit. So as I was reading it, I love to read the message, and today. You are not going to get anything on the screen because I'm going to read so much scripture today. I'm basically going to go through the entire chapter of Hebrews chapter 11, which is, you know, kind of one of those no-nos, I feel like, when, uh, when you're preaching. It's like, oh, well, don't read forever. You know, like, that's just blah, blah, blah. But the message is so good, and it paints a beautiful picture about uh, faith. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to start right from, uh, let's see, verse 1 to 3. It says, the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. The act of faith is what distinguished our ancestors, set them above the crowd. By faith, we see a world called into existence by God's word, what we see created by what we don't see. So I'm going to go back to the first part there. It says the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. So why do we live? We live because of what we believe. It's our faith that allows us to walk this life, and we live the way that you guys are actually here today on a Sunday because of what you believe, or else there would be no point to this Sunday morning. There'd be no point to a church service if none of this existed. But you guys do believe. How many in here believe in God? Okay, look around the room. Everybody believes in God. So in order to believe in God, you have what? Faith. All right. How many believe that God created you? Me. Okay. Awesome. See, even the little ones know that God created them. Okay, so, if everything in the world, God, from the beginning of time, he created the heavens and the earth, right? So, everything that's in the world, he created. And at that time, he created man. And everything that God created was good. I think the only thing that, that God saw that wasn't good was that man was alone. And to paint the picture here of our purpose, everybody having a purpose. I'm fired up about purpose. I preach about it every time, uh, or I share about it every time I preach. And this morning, I want you to try to think of anything in the world that God created that doesn't have a purpose. Every single thing does. I've tried it. I think I just heard wasps. Is that what I heard? No. Because they are beneficial to another creature. I've, I've literally, I've racked my brain on everything, trying to think, what doesn't have a purpose? And everything has a purpose. So if you're here this morning as a human being, and you're thinking, I don't really have a purpose, you're wrong. Because now, I mean, how self-centered is that thought? You're the only human in the whole planet that doesn't have a purpose? Come on. Not going to happen. Every single person has a purpose. And it's amazing because now we can live life knowing in faith that God created me with a purpose. Now, what is the purpose? What is, what makes life worth living? If faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living, what makes life worth living? It's believing that God created you for a greater purpose. That God created you for his purposes. Amen? I heard it yet. Come on. Amen. God created you out of everything in the whole world. He created you with a specific purpose. It wasn't like every single human had this like one thing. It was like you specifically. Andrew, he's thinking, hey, you, I know every single bit about you and I have a great purpose for you. There's a great purpose for every single one of us. And um, if we, uh, let me just get my bearing here. Um, so through scripture, you see Old Testament, New Testament, we see promises 
and purposes that God has placed on different people. And we see promises that have been already fulfilled that God had made. And we see promises that we're looking forward to one day. Like when Jesus comes back, we're looking forward to that. Um, in the NIV, uh, the New International Version of this scripture in the beginning um, of Hebrews chapter 11, it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we don't see. So hope is basically referring to the future. It's something that hasn't happened yet, but we're sure that it will happen. How can we be sure of that? The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the message, hearing the word of God, hearing the scriptures of Jesus, hearing the scriptures of, you know, people in the Old Testament that live lives of faith. And Hebrews chapter 11 talks all about people living lives of faith. So if you believe that what God promised will happen, that's being sure of what you hope for. My birthday is coming up. My 30th birthday is coming up. And... I know that my wife is preparing a party for me. I'm sure of it. She has told me that it's going to happen. Now, wouldn't it be crazy if it came up, my birthday came, I never had a party, nothing ever happened. Nobody even said happy birthday to me. I'm sure that people will say happy birthday to me, and I'm sure that she put together some kind of party and I'm going to get some presents. I'm sure of that. It hasn't happened yet. How can I be sure of that? Because I trust her. And I trust that my birthday is going to be important to her. So that is being sure of what we hope for. You get the picture? Now, the second part of that scripture, it says that we are certain of what we don't see. How many of you have seen God? Nobody. Oh, we got one. <laughs> okay. So we might have to talk to him after. But, um... Nobody, well, basically nobody has seen God, like seen his face, been, like we might have seen like the works that he's done and all sorts of different things, but we haven't seen God himself. But we are certain that he exists. How? Because we read the scriptures and we believe that they're true. How? How do you believe that? Hopefully I'm not rattling your faith right now. <laughs> but how do you believe that? It's because of faith. Faith is a gift. Faith is something that God had designed us to have. Like you, you're going to have to believe that I exist. You're going to have to believe that I created you with a purpose. You're going to have to believe that after you die, one day you will be in heaven with me. You will be in paradise with me. I can't wait for that day. Or else all of this that we live and that we do, sharing the gospel with people, it would make no sense if it wasn't real. But we are certain that it is. In the last part of that uh, verse, it said, By faith we see a world called into existence by God's word. What we see created by what we don't see. So we live in this world. We see everything that goes on in the world. And we believe that it was created by a God we've never seen. That is faith. So hopefully... That gives you a good idea of what faith is. And some of you are probably thinking, man, I got a lot more faith than what I thought. Because I believe all those things. I believe that God exists. I believe that I was created with a purpose. I believe that he created the world. All of these different things. I got some faith. So you have faith this morning. Looks like everybody in this room has a measure of faith. So before we go on, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read through... Um, I'm going to read through Hebrews chapter 11, pieces of it, and this is going to be going back into Old Testament. This is all people who have done amazing acts of faith, and God had done amazing acts of faith through them. But before I do that, I'm going to pray. God, we just thank you so much that we believe that you exist. We believe that we are called according to your purpose. And God, we pray that... If there is any measure of doubt in us, that today you would do something amazing in our hearts that would change and shape our lives to be exactly what you want it to be. That we would look more like you every day. God, I pray that we as Relevant Church would be like deodorant to the armpit of America. 
New Jersey. In Jesus' name. Amen. I always hated that. Oh, you live in the armpit of America. I'm like, did you see our beach? It's beautiful. Okay, so verse 4 through 12. By an act of faith, Abel brought a better sacrifice. And remember, we don't have any of this on the screen. I purposefully did that because I wanted you guys to just listen to the words coming from the message version of the Bible because they are great. And if it helps you to close your eyes, I would do it. By an act of faith, Abel brought a better sacrifice to God than Cain. It was what he believed, not what he brought, that made the difference. That's what God noticed and approved as righteous. After all these centuries, that belief continues to catch our notice. I was trying to figure out why, why Abel's was better than Cain's. And when it, when it was talking about it was what he believed, not what he brought. It's all about the idea that Cain didn't get it. Cain didn't get why he was, you know, bringing a sacrifice. Like, obviously, we see God liked the meat sacrifice more than the veggies and the fruit. So that says something. No, it doesn't. Man, you guys are cold today. <laughs> but Abel, in what he's thinking, he knows, like, hey, I'm cutting off the best portions of my meat. I know that what I'm doing is for a greater purpose. I believe it. So there was something that Cain just didn't grab a hold of. And we know how the story goes. Cain actually kills Abel uh, out of this, you know, anger that rose up in his spirit about this, like, jealousy between, you know, what Abel brought to God and what Cain brought to God. And Cain didn't understand it. He never really got it. His faith was just not there. But Abel, we see, was found righteous in God's eyes. Next we see, by an act of faith, Enoch skipped death completely. They looked all over and couldn't find him because God had taken him. We know on the basis of reliable testimony that before he was taken, he pleased God. It's impossible to please God apart from faith. And why? Because anyone who wants to approach God must believe both that he exists and that he cares enough to respond to those who seek him. How many of you pray for God to do something in your life, whether that's for healing or you're praying for somebody else or whatever? Most of us do. It's like we're praying and we believe that God's going to do something. We mere humans, this little tiny thing on the planet, we believe that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is gonna take some time to answer your prayer. And you know what? He will. That's the best part. We believe that. We have faith for God to be able to do those things. Enoch, literally, most of the people at the time of Enoch, they lived till they were about 900 years old. And Enoch only lived to being 365 years old, except he never died. He was on the earth, and I was trying to figure out, I'm like, why would God take him up? God saw that he was faithful and he was this like amazing human being. So God literally just took him up to heaven. Didn't die, didn't anything. He just like vanished. People didn't know where Enoch went. There's a very small scripture about Enoch. But if you read about it, it is really something else. And it's because Enoch lived a faithful life. I think it's so awesome. By an act of faith, Noah built a ship in the middle of dry land. He was warned about something he couldn't see and acted on what he was told. The result, his family was saved. His act of faith drew a sharp line between the evil of the unbelieving world and the righteousness of the believing world. As a result, Noah became intimate with God. By an act of faith, Abraham said yes to God's call to travel to an unknown place that would become his home. When he left, he had no idea where he was going. By an act of faith, he lived in the country promised him, lived as a stranger, camping in tents. Isaac and Jacob did the same, living under the same promise. Abraham did it by keeping his eye on an unseen city 
with real eternal foundations, the city designed and built by God. By faith, barren Sarah, who was Abraham's wife, barren Sarah was able to become, become pregnant. This is like the funniest scripture throughout this whole uh, chapter. It's beautiful. Barren Sarah was able to become pregnant, old woman as she was at the time, because she believed the one who made a promise would do what he said. That's how it happened, that from one man's dead and shriveled loins, there are now people numbering into the millions. I love that. Sarah, this old bag of bones, and this other guy who's, it's just so funny. But they believed. God called them. God had a purpose. God specifically spoke to Sarah and said, listen, when I come back here next year, you're going to be pregnant. And she's like, <laughs> all right, there's no way it's not going to happen. But she was actually in the tent when God was, was saying this. And she laughs. And God's like, did you just laugh at what I said? And she's like, no, no, I didn't. Out of fear. This literally is in the Bible. It says no. But out of, out of fear, she it gives this little chuckle. Really, as God spoke the words, he's like, yes, you did laugh. You don't believe that I can do it. And she's like, okay, I believe. Like, is this like really happening right now? Is this serious? Is this a serious moment with God? He's like calling me out. He's like looking her right in the eyes like, hey, I got you. I know you don't believe me, but it's going to happen. And then she believes. And what happens the next year? Boo! She's pregnant. Old bag of bones, pregnant, she has the baby, and it's amazing. So each of these people all, all share something in common. Faith. They all live lives of faith, and they all had eyes on the new country. That's how, that's how the message puts uh, heaven, puts the kingdom of God. It says the new country and the old country. The old country being a life of sin, a life that is just worldly. And it says that all of these people had their eyes on the new country. They didn't care what circumstances they were living in. They knew that God had the hand on their lives, that they were able to move forward in their call, that Baron Sarah would get pregnant, that Enoch, just living a faithful life, God would be close to him and just pull him straight up, that Noah would survive and end up repopulating the entire earth. I was going to say Abel, but Abel ends up getting killed by his brother. Huh. <laughs> but they all stayed away from their old ways. They all stayed away from the sinful ways because of that picture. They're, them just thinking, hey, God's promise is real. I'm sure of what I hope for. I'm sure that what God says is going to happen. And that's a perfect example where Baron Sarah ends up getting pregnant. That was a promise that God made. She could be sure that what she hopes for will happen. A year later, God comes back, just like he said, and she's pregnant. We can be sure that what God says for your lives and for mine, that it's going to happen because we believe it. It is faith. So here are more acts of faith. There's tons of them in this chapter. By faith, Abraham, at the time of testing, offered Isaac back to God, acting in faith. He was as ready to return the promised son, his only son, as he had been to receive him. And this, after he had already been told, your descendants shall come from Isaac. Now Abraham's probably like, what in the world? Okay, well, God's got a plan here. If he wants me to kill my son, but all of the descendants are going to come out of Isaac, something's going to happen here. So he believes it. And faithfully goes up the hill. We know what happens. Abraham figured that if God wanted him to do it, he could raise the dead. In a sense, that's exactly what happened. When he received Isaac back alive from the altar. By an act of faith, Isaac reached into the future as he blessed Jacob and Esau. By an act of faith, Jacob, on his deathbed, blessed each of Joseph's sons. In turn, blessing them with God's blessing, not his own as he bowed worshipfully upon his staff. By an act of faith, Joseph, while dying, prophesied that the exodus of Israel and made arrangements for his own burial. By an act of faith, Moses' parents hid him away for three months after his birth. They saw the child's beauty and they braved the king's decree. By faith, Moses, when grown, 
refused the privileges of the Egyptian royal house. He chose a hard life with God's people rather than an opportunistic life, uh, sorry, opportunistic soft life of sin with the oppressors. He valued suffering in the Messiah's camp far greater than Egyptian wealth because he was looking ahead, anticipating the payoff. By an act of faith, he turned his heel on Egypt, indifferent to the king's blind rage. He had his eye on the one no eye can see and kept right on going. By an act of faith, he kept the Passover feast and sprinkled Passover blood on each house so that the destroyer of the firstborn could not touch them. By an act of faith, Israel walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. The Egyptians tried and they drowned. By faith, the Israelites marched around the walls of Jericho for seven days and the walls fell flat. By an act of faith, Rahab, the Jericho harlot, welcomed the spies and escaped the destruction that came on those who refused to trust God. There are tons, tons and tons of people of faith. And actually, the writer of Hebrews, we don't know who it is. We could guess and say who it might be, maybe Paul. I have no idea. You can look it up. They're not sure who wrote Hebrews, but he says, I could go on and on. So he already knows he's going on and on with all of these people of faith. I can go on and on, but I've run out of time. There are so many more. Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets through acts of faith. They toppled kingdoms, made justice work, took the promises for themselves they were protected from lions, fires, and sword thrusts, turned disadvantages to advantages, won battles, routed alien armies. Women received their loved ones back from the dead. But there were also those who under torture refused to give in and go free, preferring something better, resurrection. Others braved abuse and whips, and yes, chains and dungeons. We have stories of those who were stoned, sawed in two, murdered in cold blood. Stories of vagrants wandering the earth in animal skins. Homeless, friendless, powerless. The world didn't deserve them. Making their way as best they could on the cruel edges of the world. So whether life was amazing or it was a terrible circumstance, they lived by faith and not by the physical. They didn't live by the circumstance that was going on or else most of these people, if you're living in animal skins or if you're getting thrown in dungeons or if you're doing this, you're probably gonna try to avert and go the other way so that you don't get whipped and chained and beaten and tortured and all these different things. You have Daniel, Daniel in a lion's den. I mean, who's thought of that punishment? Like, you know what? We're going to fill a hole with a bunch of sharks. Nope, nope. We're going to make it a lion's den. We're going to pack it with lions. And then we're going to throw somebody in it who won't worship me. The stuff that some of these people went through, and they pushed through it because they believed the end result is what they were living for, not the now. How many times do we go through life and we just see the now? It could be the car that you're pursuing. It could be the girlfriend that you're pursuing. It could be the house that you want to get. It could be that location. Whatever it is, it's all these things that are just the now. They're great. They're fun. But think about the later. Think about what's setting this up for a bigger picture where God's like, man, you're missing the mark. If that's what life is all about, it's about the things and about the stuff and about whatever you're going through at the moment, then you're missing the mark because all of these people we see, if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, we read these scriptures, we see that all of them lived amazing lives of faith and all believing that something great would happen. You know, I just recently started, just recently started surfing and uh, this will tie in in a second. But when I get into something, my wife knows I, uh, I can go a little overboard. I mean, I literally, I take it to levels that people probably shouldn't. Um, I, wanted a, I wanted a putter, a golfing like putter. And I made one out of wood and was like melting lead to like pour into this thing. I wanted a snare drum 
And instead of buying one, I'm like, you know what, I'll make one. Because that would probably be cheaper and, you know, who knows, I might like the sound. She's like, how do you know if it's going to work out? I don't. But I, I know these measurements, everything's going to work out. So then I make that. Then I start making skateboards. I start making all this sorts of crazy stuff. And that's my personality. I just, like, go crazy. Then I'm having a conversation with my wife about surfing. I just got into surfing, like not even a month ago. And I'm like going crazy looking at my surf app. I'm like looking at the waves and seeing, I'm like, ah, oh, one to two footers. Ah, oh, but they're starred, so it could be good. I got a seven foot eight board. I should be able to ride, whatever. My mind goes crazy on surfing now. I'm like talking to her and she's talking about how all right, well, it looks like surfing's taking over in your mind, and I'm like thinking about the waves. No, it's not true. But uh, it is intense what happens in my life when something like grabs a hold of me like that. So anyway, uh, I didn't want to take it too far, so I made a surfboard just recently um, out of wood, a whole bunch of planks, uh, and put the surfboard together, which was so much fun. And then I'm spending my time going out Early in the morning, I'll shoot out and I'll check the waves and I'll first obviously check the surf app, I'll check the website and I'll look and I'll see the waves look nice. So I go out and I go for a surf. And what I've learned from surfing, like I said, I've only been doing it for a little less than a month. So surfing is not easy at all. I came from a life of skateboarding. So you think, okay, you know, like it could be fairly easy to pop up on the board and go riding through the waves. and. You know, I was a snowboarder for years too. This should be fine. But I go out there and the technicalities of everything, I gotta learn all sorts of different things sitting on the board. How many of you have gone surfing? Anybody? Okay, we got a few. Sitting. I mean, literally just going and sitting on the board in the water. It's not that easy. I'm looking out there and I see these little kids. I actually saw like a super old woman sitting on a surfboard and they're all just like arms folded looking at the waves to come just like you know no problem and I'm sitting there on my board arms flailing like feet like I'm trying to like stay on my board Wait, what is going on what are they doing that I'm not and it's this technique it's probably technique and everybody asked me are you thinking about sharks when you're in the water and I'm like well, everybody keeps asking me that. So yeah, every time I go in the water, I'm now thinking about sharks. And you know what? Sharks, they go after the flailing stuff, people making noise. I'm sitting on my board, flailing around like a goof. So obviously, I feel like a target. But as you're surfing waves, there's millions of analogies that I could use here about surfing. But the one that I did learn you have to pick like the perfect spot of this wave and you have to paddle as hard as you can. It feels like I've missed millions of waves because I just wasn't positioned right and I didn't paddle fast enough. And I stood up on some good waves here and there. I had some really good rides. So these are some of the pictures that I would post. I look like a pro. And for, for some of you, you can't really see my head. I saw back there, so you can't really see it, but that is me. And we go to the next one. Done. I am like a good surfer. But this is through like hours of film that I'm trying to find like the one good spot. Like that picture, I was probably up in that wave for like three seconds and then fell. But that picture, I'm like, yes. If I post this on Instagram, everybody knows that I am a good surfer. But then the truth comes out. This is what it's like most of the time. If you see the beach, like that's, that's horizontal. Oops. That's horizontal right there. So if you flip this over, I'm flying off of this thing. And that is what happens most of the time. But what I'm trying to get at here is that my addiction, is that what I can call it? Um, it went far to the point where I started, I started surfing the web for, you know, best waves ever caught, best surfboards, you know, whatever, all sorts of different surfboard things, surfboard things. And in my research, I found this photo. Some of you can't see, you can see a little piece maybe. 
For those of you who are a little closer, you can see there is a jet ski way up at the top of this photo. I'll move around so that just in case some of you can't see it because of me. There's a jet ski at the top with a guy who's flying off of that jet ski, like for his life. Because this, whatever that is, 35 foot wave, however big that is, it's massive. You see the surfer? He's just coasting. And this guy up there is like, oh, I'm going to die! <laughs> it's not funny. But what he did, I know, people are laughing. I'm like, what? But let me show you how you get into this position. Like for that surfer to be where he is, and that guy to be where he is, this is what's happening. I don't think there's any sound, so just watch. So in order for these guys to catch enough speed to catch these massive waves, they have to be towed in by a jet ski. And it doesn't always work out. But you see the surfer's fine. Who knows what happened to that guy? <laughs> this, this was a, a sail surfer, whatever, that went in there. Now this guy, I did find out that he survived, but his jet ski absolutely didn't. It is smashed to pieces. That, if you know anything about surfing, that was Jaws. Not the movie Jaws, the waves Jaws, because they are dangerous and they're crazy. But this all to say, when I saw that picture, can we go back to the photo with the jet ski all the way up at the top? When I saw this picture, I was praying for an illustration for this message. I love illustrations in messages, and I thought, oh, if I don't have an illustration, God, at least you've painted such a great picture in your uh, text, because it is such awesome verbiage that's in here. But when I saw this photo, I thought instantly, I'm like, you know what? Everybody that came before Christ, everybody in the Old Testament, they were basically like the guy on the jet ski. They lived a life that was for Christ, he didn't even exist yet. He didn't come into the picture yet. God didn't send his son yet, but they live life with their vision on what was going to happen, and they live life that way so that we could read back and see the lives of faith, and they set us up for this amazing way. We get to experience it. But they didn't. Every one of them didn't. But Jesus comes, God sends his son, and now we have this massive wave that every one of those people that came before, they're all like, you better catch that wave. You better. Because I live life as a transient in this world. A transient, let me see, I believe I have, uh, I have the meaning of a transient. Yes. A transient is someone lasting only for a short time, a temporary, short-lived Short-term, impermanent, brief, short, momentary, fleeting, passing, here today, gone tomorrow kind of life. They live that way, but knowing God's going to make that happen. My birthday is going to happen. God's going to make that promise happen where his son is going to save everybody from what we have to do. We have these commandments that we have to live by. We have a law that we have to live by. Adam and Eve were created into a world and had one rule not to break, and they broke it. Human nature is to break the rules. Human nature brings us into a sinful life. And you see the next group of people where God creates commandments. He says, you got these 10 commandments that you have to live by. It's like, okay, we could do this. You can't do this. We learned that nobody could keep those commandments. Constantly things happen. We could list off all the things. And the thing is, if you broke one of them, you're in the wrong. Jesus says in John, if you have sinned, you are a slave to sin instantly. Like that's what it is. Just that one sin. You are now in a life of sin. You need Jesus now. 
It's not about sacrificing lambs. The lamb has been sacrificed. And now we get to live in a position where God's purpose, God's call, who he is, we get to experience grace like none of those people, even though they lived extraordinary lives, doing amazing things that God did amazing works through them, none of them got to experience what was promised. But I will tell you this, every one of us lives in the promise. Every one of us lives a life that is designed by God that we could be in his grace. That we could be found righteous in his eyes, not by being the best like, um, like Miguel said this morning. It's not by works. It's not by me being the best person I could be. It's all because of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So that life, that wave that we as relevant church could just take and bring other people into. That is what life is all about. Going right back to the beginning, the fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. What makes life worth living? Living for Jesus. That's what it comes down to. It's all for living for Jesus. There's a story in the Bible about Mary and Martha and this is just showing you that even Jesus knew, like, hey, those other people didn't get to experience, but you guys do. Martha, we know, was in the kitchen, and she comes to Jesus and says, listen, God, I need you to talk to my sister. Can't you see that she is not doing anything? I've been slaving in that kitchen. I need her to move her butt so we can get these brownies out of the oven, whatever it was. I need her to move. And Jesus comes back. He's like, man, you're missing the mark. You are missing the point. You are trying to serve. You're trying to work. You're trying to do all these things. The one essential thing in life is what she's doing right now. Well, what's she doing? Is she working hard? Is she doing anything? No. She's literally just sitting there at Jesus' feet, listening to his every word. Being encouraged, being empowered by them. So to see that the one essential thing in life is listening to Jesus, being empowered, being encouraged by him, that's what life is all about. So I would pray that none of us are missing the mark. None of us would miss this wave because, God forbid, one day you come in contact with Enoch or Noah or any one of them. They're going to be like, what did you do? Look at the life I lived. I never even got to experience grace at all like it was ready for you. But we have it. We have it ready right at our fingertips. It's like God gave it to us. This massive gift, like my birthday coming up. God has this awesome gift in store for every single one of us. I just believe that today there could very well be people here who have walked through life in a, in a way that was just eking their way through life. Where they didn't know if they believed, like, yeah, I believe in God, I guess. Most people do. I believe in him, but, I mean, what does that mean for me? What does that do for me? Hopefully this, hopefully this message would show you that it is not about your life. It's not about what you're going through right now. It's about what you're going to get to. It's about where God wants to take you in your life. You know, he's got an amazing purpose, an amazing call for every single one of you. And I pray that none of us would miss the mark. He's so unfortunate. God sends his son to die on the cross, to raise from the dead, and we miss the mark.
Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a crier, but I could. I'm just gonna lay it on the table for every eye to be closed. Everybody's focused on themselves, their own heart, not looking around. I want everybody to have some privacy right now. Is the biggest decision of your life is to ride the wave. <laughs> so if you're here this morning, and you want to experience Jesus. Maybe you believe in him. You believe in God. You believe that he created you. You believe that he created the world. But you just don't have a relationship with him. You don't have a relationship with Jesus. Who came to bear your sins. To heal the sick. Raise the dead. When he died, he took all of the weight of all of those legalistic, law-abiding things that had to be done previously to Jesus. And he took all of those upon himself so that grace could be found. So if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, I'm going to count to three and give you an opportunity to meet him for the first time. And all I'm going to have you do is slip up your hand. And in faith, receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. One, two, three. You could raise your hand up. You could raise your hand up. It's all about Christ. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Well, Lord, I thank you so much. Thank you so much for this faith, for this grace that you have poured upon the earth. That people before Christ lived a life looking towards the goal, looking towards your kingdom, the new country, and not going back to the old country, the old life of sin. Pray that for every one of us in the room, that we would all know you, that we would all trust you. That our foundation of what makes life worth living would be our faith. That we would believe that you have the best for our lives. And that we are going to move forward in your call every single day. That today, Sunday, that it would mark the point in our lives that set us up for the rest of our lives. That we would be prepared. That we would be empowered to move by faith. And not by sight, that we wouldn't be shaken by what happens in the world. That wouldn't be shaken by what happens in our own lives with God, that we would trust you. And we would move forward in your call as a church, as people who love you, as people called to be with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys good? Woo. Sure. You know, there's something that my dad does at his church, and I love it. I've, I've done it before, but I want you guys to stand to your feet. Before you go, I'm going to pray a blessing over you. I kind of already did that. But this will just be one pointed and short. God, we bless your people. That as they walk out into this world, they would be filled with an immeasurable amount of faith. That you would do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. That your peace that surpasses passes all understanding would be upon us. And that in faith, we would stand in this world that wants to pull us down. But we will stand up, we will rise up, and we will fight the good fight. Because you are God, and you love us. And you've called us to live in your grace every day. In Jesus' name, bless your people. Awesome. You guys have an amazing day. Have an amazing week. Awesome.